Yeah, it's a, it's a little weird sometimes, you know, life. A little. Always play out <laughs> what we expect. That's been my experience, I can tell you. Well, I was uh, catching up with some of the Meru material. Yeah. That's a lot weird. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It's a, it's a lot to digest. And, you, and I, I have to admit, your uh, seed questions you posed got, kept me noodling most of the weekend. Um, I was doing a lot of noodling. <laughs> so, because it, you know, I, I've been, uh, I don't want to say studying it, I, but I've been trying to engage it for a long time. And, and every time I look at it, then I find something new or something I hadn't, seen before or I overlooked or, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the thing that we go through no matter what it is that we do. You know, you can, when, when you read a text the second time, you read Slaughter like the second time, it's, it's really a different book because, you know, you're bringing everything that you learned or thought you learned the first time back in when you, when you read it the second time. And so it's kind of a, a regenerative process itself. Mm-hmm. And so you keep finding things and, and you go, okay, well, what does that mean? And, and and everything that we do, I believe, I when I studied in, uh, in Gießen at the university here in Germany, I had a professor who was uh, he was I'm gonna I'm gonna say it a little more pointedly than it, than it needs to be, but he was really a dyed in the world wool hermeneuticist. Um, he had he had studied under Gadamer and and his his he, he spent the entire five years that I was studying there writing a book on on understanding texts okay. what does it take to understand a text to actually grasp what's what's in a text kind of thing that was his that was his big thing and and that that made a huge impression on me because i spent most of my those were graduate days but most of that time that i was studying there trying to figure well how do we understand anything or how do we know what we know or you know the, the questions that keep popping up here sometimes on the side sometimes a little more directly these ontological and epistemological questions um, got really implanted very deeply into me. So whenever we're reading something, and, and I found this, the, the discussion today about, about reading, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and writing and whether you need to read and write, and whatever, oh, wow, you know, um, extremely poignant because that is precisely the kinds of things that, we were discussing hot and heavy back in 1977 when I was studying in Gießen. Mm-hmm. How do you know what? How do you know what not to read without reading it? Well, that's the whole thing. You see, you, you can't. You, you're always in this bind. You know, <laughs> you're like, well, that's not worth reading. Well, you don't know that until you read it. You know, and so and then you go through it and you go, oh, I shouldn't have read that. Well, too late now. <laughs> but you already did. So whatever was was in there, for good or for bad or for better or for worse or indifferent or not, well, you've incorporated some of it. So you're mm-hmm. not the same person now that you were before. I don't, I don't care what it is you read. You can read a comic book and you can, or, you know, the same is true if you, you know, watch TV or if you watch a cartoon or if you, or if you get into, you know, uh, 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 Doug mentioned the um, Habib and these really intricate, drawings that that come out of you know arabic script so to speak Mm -hmm. you know the arabs have been calligraphying things in in ways that are mind-boggling in a lot of regards because they've got this really strong prohibition you can't make an image you know and so now there's this guy he's kind of like making images out of them you know Mm -hmm. and he's he's really walking right along that borderline that you know the envelope that everybody wants to push and very few people are willing to go out there and actually push it, you know, because he's, he's combining those, those kinds of things. And, and, and that impacts our consciousness and it changes the way that we look at things later on. So even that, you know, is a kind of reading, you know, to me, reading is not just decoding text. That's what most people kind of focus on, but it's something much more than that. And that's, what's always fascinating to me about what Stan Tennant has been doing in Meru is that, there are these letters, but it's not like letters like we understand letters. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's, it's just it's just a whole different reality, so to speak. And and I don't know if he's right, but 
what he says and the way he's going about it makes a whole lot of sense. And the thing that I admire the most about Tendon is he has spent his entire career. It took him, you know, I've, I first called him on the phone in 1989 and he had been working on this for 20 years. And he, they, they had a newsletter from their little group. This was back in email days and when things actually got sent out by mail. Uh, they had a net little newsletter I got, and they had only started publishing that a few years before that. Mm-hmm. Because they wouldn't tell anybody in the public anything until they had run it past as many mathematicians and 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 scholars that they could find to say, "Well, well, tell me this should it shouldn't be this way." So tell me why why it is, and 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 that's how he gets a lot of uh, people involved in this. He spent. Um, years and years traveling to Israel, working with people who don't talk to outsiders. He's he's Jewish by heritage and is um, is is living Orthodox these days. And so, because they wouldn't talk to him otherwise, mm-hmm. it's like, well, I won't even talk to you about it, mm-hmm. kind of thing. So, and and he's looking at it, and they're showing him things and telling him things. He goes, well, that's what I'm seeing here too. You know, mm-hmm. so it's a, it's this really strange mixture of, you know, I was just reading through um, the, the page that we had. It's mythology and fact. It's, it's actually an example of why mythology could be true, like in a Gapesarian sense. Because mm-hmm. Gapes said, well, mythology is true. But it's it is. not the story in this case. That's the no, it's not the story. Yeah, that's the thing. The story just kind of like gets your att- it gets your attention and leads you into it. Mm-hmm. And the truth is embedded in the text. Now, this is a literal embedded in the text. But I believe and that that was the discussion that that I I kind of heard going on a little today. We read texts and this is what I mean by deep reading. This is what my Professor and Giesen, the, the hermeneuticist, talked about you, you have to really get into the text to find out what the text says. And, and it's, it's not easy at all. And you're constantly stumbling over your own self because you realize, well, I, I just read that in there. It's, it's not there at all. And this is why it's really nice when we have other people in the discussion. They, they can call you on it. Or at least make you aware of the fact, well, maybe you're, you're reading something in there. And we spent, most of the seminars I spent with this guy was, was absolutely fascinating. Because we spent a lot of time looking at text, trying to figure out, well, what are they really saying? And this was independent of what we thought might the intentions might be. And, and, um, and you know, all of this biographical, you know, how, how did she say it in the text? They re, you read around the text. You, you look at the criticism of the text to, to kind of get around having to engage the text itself. And you say, well, I don't need to deal with that because the person is just, he's got too much of himself in there. Well, I should hope that people have themselves in their texts. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I would like to discover, well, who is that that's speaking? Who's that, who is that speaker that's in there? Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a different kind of reading. It's a, a different understanding of text, I think, than the most of us generally have, you know. And and this is you know this is what I found out all along. We we tend to think the texts are telling us something, and it may be that they are they're doing something more than that. Even even with our own little te- te- I say little texts, the ones that aren't encoded to the level, let's say, that Genesis might be, mm-hmm. because that that makes it kind of qualitatively different than others. Because we haven't found that letter level coding elsewhere. Well. He's found it in the Quran, and they found it in the New Testament, and they mm-hmm. found it in some Buddhist texts. And all of a sudden, everybody that, that re- seriously made a claim that I have a sacred language, it starts showing up. Mm-hmm. And, and that's disturbing in a lot of regards as well. Because they, they, they're basically, and this is one of the points he makes, they're all saying the same. Oh, Doug's here. Uh, they're all kind of saying the same thing. And, and that, that's both very disconcerting and very reassuring at the same time because it really shouldn't be that way. But why is it? (laughs) Yeah. And so, and so your seed questions, that that's what got me, you know, really noodling here over the weekend because it's like, okay, well, are there relationships and, you know, we've done some things together. 
where the links and where the disjoints and, and whatnot. And that's kind of like what I'd, uh, you know, like to, to get into uh, tonight. Um, hi, Doug. How you doing? I'm all right. Glad to be here. Good. Sorry I'm late. <laughs> no, you don't have to be sorry about being late. We're all relieved that we're not just the two of us. <laughs> no, it's always good to have as many uh, many voices as possible in a, in a talk like this. Uh, so I have a question for both of you. Have either of you seen the movie Arrival? I haven't. It's next on my list. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give a, a very succinct summary of it. Uh, and this won't do the film justice. And the film, from a critical perspective, I think, uh, you know, was successful in some ways and not successful in others. But the premise of this film is that 12, uh, there's an event that occurs where 12 alien spaceships uh, appear on the Earth at different points on the Earth. And uh, they kind of hover you know, about, up just above the ground. They don't provoke anything in terms of, uh, you know, uh, attack or, or, or anything like that, but of course cause a great amount of alarm amongst you know, people and the governments of the planet because it's, an, you know, it's in the open. It's not a, uh, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, hidden encounter with individuals in the middle of the night. It's, it's happening on a world scale. And uh, in the course of the movie, there's a... a uh, uh, okay, the, the, the lead character comes to communicate uh, with these beings who've come in, in, in the ships, at least in one of them. Uh, and each, you know, each location has their own team of military and so forth that are trying to um, establish contact or determine intentions or uh, prepare for, you know, possible attack, etc. But the movie doesn't get actually violent. It's a much more cerebral movie, and it's much more about, and it becomes about the process of uh, communication. Uh, because what the lead character does, she's a, a if my memory serves me, a physicist, uh, is learn that kind of crack, not not crack the code exactly, um, but uh, kind of enter into their state in a way that they are able to impose or kind of project these elaborate big shapes. They kind of that look like these sacred types of letters. They have uh, almost kind of like a brush stroke quality to them, and they're kind of uh, three dimensional. And the they are um, you know they come in these single units, where each unit is a complex like multi dimensional quote unquote signifier uh, of its own. So she discovers this and then kind of pu puts together the pieces of a puzzle. And I, I don't want to, you know, not to spoil it. This would be a spoiler alert. Stop listening. Stop listening to this. But at the end, it turns out that what they have given humanity in 12 distinct pieces that have to be uh, cor uh, correlated to each other uh, mm -hmm. is a language. They've given them a language. Uh, and it... And so then that mixes in with the personal story about this this woman and her. Uh, she develops an ability to see, uh, in a sense, transtemporally. She gains mm -hmm. a different perspective in time or of time uh, by understanding this language and by learning to think in it or perceive in it. So it reminds me a lot of this conversation. Mm -hmm. It's part of mm -hmm. why I've gone from being kind of slightly skeptical and, um, you know, like just a kind of interested, but, but skeptical to being intrigued, more intrigued, mm. <laughs> let's mm. say, uh, because of course the alien motif is, you know, one particular way of interpreting, you know, such a, uh, such an event. Um, but, uh, there may be others. And I think it's interesting not just to speculate, but to meditate on uh, what the agency may be who uh, would communicate in such a language. Because we're used to uh, assuming that there's a speaker, like an individual human person. We have a concept of what that is that is producing speech, which we interpret and understand. But something different seems to be happening here. Uh, and I'm you know, I'm just newly being introduced to the Meru idea and the research. And I watched some of the uh, Stan's talk 
which was in 1989. It was recorded stuff on YouTube. Uh, yeah. Oh, did you did you watch the that first one? I didn't finish it. Okay. But yeah, yeah. Enough to still, kind of get a feel for what he's like and his kind of way yeah. of thinking. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what you reported about him seems true as far as his uh, intellectual humility and um, kind of uh, just way of going about uh, this approach, uh, yeah. you know, working with with this material that he has found. I was looking at, I was looking for the title of a, an essay uh, he wrote. I, I I don't find it right off the bat um, because your your little description of the movie uh, struck me very hard. It's how, how do you, how would we communicate with aliens? Is one of the things that he wrote because if if this is a let's say if what he has discovered is a universal means of communication and i think that's that's what it is primarily but if it isn't an, an international uh, a universal means of communication well then it is one way that we would do that I and mean, he he did mention it in that that first talk that you you saw at least part of and he's mentioned it elsewhere as well you know we've sent these images into space these you know radio teleradio communications um, hoping to to meet with extraterrestrial life, and and when you look at how they're constructed to say, well, this is who we are and how we kind of function, it's it's a very fascinating kind of um, kind of thing because people have thought about that, and and what what Stan appears to have found and what he thinks he might be onto is, well, there's actually a simpler way of doing it. And, and and it would be possible to do that. I find, I'm going to have to take a look at the movie. That's for sure, mm-hmm. uh, because um, this whole the whole idea of, of twelveness, um, um, for example, I, I was affiliated with the Rosicrucians for a year, and they for for years, and and they believe that there that there are twelve sages on the planet. Um, they may or may not know themselves who they are. No. Um, and they are there, and they ensure balance. Uh, in Kabbalistic teaching, there are, there are 12 wise men. There are 12 imams in, in Islam uh, who are hidden and not or virtual or not real or not there or whatever, but, you know, are always present in order to help, help guide us. So that whole idea of, of there's, there's a, at least an earthly, um, we, we say that the story of Genesis is about the creation of the universe, but it might be the creation of our universe. We, we, within physics themselves, there's all, you know, the multiple universe theory and um, there, there may be more than one. So this might be just our own cosmological sphere that we're talking about. I have a quick question, Ed. Now jump right in anytime. About the, the 12, yeah. like you're saying the 12 are there to help us. Is there a, a negative 12 that would be there to pull us back out? Um, I'm thinking of my favorite author, David Mitchell. Kind of, He has an underlying cosmos that he's developing in his novels, and I can't remember if he has 12 total of the characters, but it seems to be approaching that number in which there are these, these kind of sages that are reborn and take form in another body. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that, is there a negative twelve? Um, that really depends on what school of thought you're dealing with. Um, there, there can be this. The, if, if we look at it in ma- um, Manichaean terms, um, Zarathustra, thus speaks Zarathustra has, has come up. And he was Zarathustraism is the same way. It was very influenced by Manichaeism, and their basic tenant is there's not one God, there's two. There's one of light and there's one of darkness. There, it's, it's in the opposition. And the whole idea of uh, Gnostic um, theology or Gnostic understanding, go back to the, um, the Hermeticists in the, in the post-Renaissance, um, there's a very strong distinction between light and dark, between um, body and soul, between mind and spirit. You know, Descartes was not the first person to come up with it. He's the one that intellectualized it, and it's the one that science ran with. But that whole idea has been around for a very, very long time. Um, what 
what, what Tenen's saying is, it's about the distinction. <laughs> it's not about the light and dark, it's about the distinction itself. Because without the contrast, you can't have anything. You can't know anything at all. It's, it's, it's really more fundamental than, than, than that. It, it's, it, I think it's a good way to start thinking about it, and I think it's a good way to deal with it, and it's a good way to wrestle with the whole idea. Um, there's a Kabbalistic teaching, for example, that, uh, that, that there's, there's more than one Torah, for example, and there's a Torah that's written with uh, white letters of, of fire on black fire, and there's one that's written with black fire on white fire, uh, kind of. And so it, it kind of conveys that same kind of image that uh, uh, the yin, yin and yang symbol is the same thing where we have light and dark, white and black. They're intermingled with each other because what's essential to understand is that without that fundamental distinction, without that, with really without having distinction at all, no, we can't know anything. There's nothing, there's nothing to be known. And, and so explore, exploring and looking for and, and trying to, to get behind, is the way the Germans would say, to try to get behind that notion of contrast, of differentiation, is really the most important first step you can take, and it's a long step to take because you spend a lot of time time dealing with it. And I had mentioned in the, the presentation last time that there are these kind of different flavors of uh, Kabbalah, and one of them is the Tree of Life, and, and the, the Tree of Life gets generated from the top down, but when you deal with it as a person trying to study it, you work from the bottom up because you're trying to climb the tree back up to the, the pinnacle. Um, you're trying to return to the source, so to speak. Um, the first lesson to be learned in the first sephirah, the one at the bottom of the tree, Malkut, which is kingdom, which is the everyday earth, is discernment and discrimination. H how do I decide? How, how do I understand? How do I differentiate? How do I make distinctions so that I can that I can get into something at all. And, and the, the thing that's very important, I think, about like the mental structure of consciousness, it's taken that finding distinctions to such an extreme that it thinks there's nothing but distinctions. And so it tears things apart. Uh, when you look, work through the, the structures of consciousness, they, they're, they're first in the magical world, there really is none. But in mythical, we get into this oceanic polarity kind of flowing back and forth kind of thing, but it's in the mental structure of consciousness where we take them actually apart. And one of the things that I have a problem with a lot of uh, modern philosophers is they take things apart as a construct in order to look at them, but they never put them back together again. And by not putting them back together, you don't know what the whole is, but you need to have looked at the whole the first. I mean, Hegel went into his dialectic and said, okay, well, when you put them together, something new pops out. Well, yes and no. It, it all depends on how you took them apart and put them back together again, whether something new pops out of it or not. But what we tend to, we need that. It's a, it's a very important tool uh, that we have to use, but sometimes we let our tools, this is the problem I have with a lot of AI and a lot of modern technology, sometimes we let our tools tell us what we can do rather than using the tools to do things that we want to do. Sometimes we have to find other uses for them. And we have to we have to go about them in a different way. So so that whole idea of distinction and, and whether whether there are twelve or not twelve just happens to be the number that that shows up in his model of continuous creation as well, um, which is why I like it because it does explain in a lot of ways or provide at least let's say a metaphorical construct for understanding why would there be twelve. <laughs> and not 13 or a 14 or 150, you know, um, the, the numbers three, seven, and 12 pop up in the Hebrew alphabet themselves. There's three different kinds of letters. For example, there are three mother letters, Aleph, Mem, and Shin, or we would say A, M, and, and S, or Sh, at any rate. And, and these, these letters appear in his geometric metaphor in very specific places, and they, and they, they don't show up in other places. And they are basically the foundation from everything else rolls uh, and, and unfurls. And those are associated with 
what we would call alchemical elements. Aleph is associated with air, Shin is associated with fire, Mem is associated with water. Um, there's no earth in Kabbalah, just like there are only three elements in alchemy, there's only three elements in uh, Kabbalah as well, because we're, we're here, the manifestation that we see is actually water-based, so to speak. It's all water. Uh, that's what comes up in the, when you just read the story of Genesis, um, when you read through the first five cents, Elohim spends a whole lot of time separating waters. <laughs> there's, there's water, there's the waters above, there's waters below, and, and later on, you know, after light was there, he starts separating them into solid land, you know. But up until that time, there's just all this water, and there's chaotic water, and there's tohu vabohu. So you know, but it's but it's water. So that's this basic the basic element, so to speak, from which other others come um, and arise. Reminds one of Heraclitus. From, he was also a, a water guy, but some of the Greeks said, "Well, it was fire, and it was this and, and whatnot." But these these letters kind of represent that in one sense. It's a again a useful tool to help us think about them. And then the number seven pops up um, repeatedly because there are seven of the letters in the Hebrew alphabet. If you look at the chart that I provided in the last um, uh, session in the presentation, there are seven letters that have double meanings or two sounds to them. And like beat can either be a b or a v. Uh, you hear that when you speak of anybody, well, Marco would know this, you speak Spanish. Um, a lot of my Spanish speaking friends, they go on, they go on vacation, they don't go on vaca vacation uh, kind of thing because B and V are very closely related to one another. Uh, there's two G sounds. One was probably softer than the other. We have a G, but there could be an aspirated one. We see this in Buddhism, for example. D is also a double letter. Um, the D in Sanskrit can be aspirated or not. We don't do that in English, so it's hard for us to understand what those might be. So there are seven letters that have these two sounds to them. So they also play a particular role. And then there are 12 single letters in the end. And that's and everything that's 12, and we have a lot of 12s in our lives as well. We have 12 signs of the zodiacs, and there's 12 months in a year because we use a solar calendar. And we have, in all of our religious traditions, at least the Abrahamic traditions themselves, we have 12s. We have Jesus and the 12 disciples. We have Muhammad and the 12 imams, and we have... Uh, um, Moses and the 12 tri tribes of Israel, that's, that's the fundamental motif. It's 112 uh, is, the, um, is, is the, the, num the numerical metaphor, at any rate, uh, that is used. And it, as it turns out, with his model that he has with his hand, the singular, uh, because that's really the key thing, that it's, it's this flame-like element that you could put in your hand and create visually or at least in your mind, these Hebrew letters, um, you would need 12 hands to make that whole apple. You need three around, because the thumbs all overlap. So you would have three around the top and three around the bottom. But that's also, metaphorically speaking, that whole idea of above, as above, so below, which is a hermetic principle that, that you know, everything's the same. Whatever happens in heaven happens on earth. This is also a statement that shows up in the New Testament. Um, Right before um, Peter gets the keys to the kingdom, he says anything that you know is loosed in heaven will be loosed on earth, and blah blah blah. The Catholics use that as a basis for what they're doing. Um, oddly enough, right after he does tell him that, he also says to Peter, "Get thee behind me, Satan." So, <laughs> because um, Peter in his brashness makes a statement that you go, "Oh, well, that's that's really not what he said before." So there. Are, there are different ways of reading these texts now and even the stories themselves based on these metaphors that the model itself provides as well. And, and, it, and it leads to very different understandings of these texts than the ones that we generally have. So that's, that's, that's also one of the consequences that kind of falls out of, of, of what he's saying. And, and it's, um, and, it, and I, I agree with you 100%, Marco, because I, I, that's exactly what I did. For the longest time, I'm going, okay, well, that's kind of nice, but. And it's really interesting, but. And it really can't be that way, or can it? And, and the more that you get into it, the more, the more sound it seems, the more sane it seems, at least to me at any rate, because 
I have been dealing with it. And I, and I find it is a very helpful hermeneutical tool to use to understand things that I encounter elsewhere. Because sometimes um, it's very difficult to, especially when you're reading older texts. I mean, we, most people have trouble reading Adam Smith because he was written in the 18th century. I can assure you, if you try to read the Bible in its original Hebrew, you're dealing with an entirely different uh, worldscape because there, there's something else going on in the way that they, they decided to slice reality because it's nothing like we do. So um, it's always helpful to have a tool on hand that can help you kind of decode, and I, and I use the word consciously, kind of decode sign up some of the enigmas that keep popping up when you're, when you're dealing with them. So that's, that's my, the reason for my interest in, in this whole thing. But the, the real fundamental, the basis of, of what Stan is saying is, this isn't just a story about this, this is it as well. And the statement, this is it, is a, is a very difficult one, one to come to. And it's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult one to accept. And um, if you want to throw something in, please do. And if you want to ask any questions at any time, please do. But I thought what might be helpful, since Marco did provide questions that had me noodling all weekend, that we would at least go through those questions. And I can give you my two cents on what I think I... I noodled out of that in that time. If that's okay with you guys. Let's do it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sounds good. Okay. So, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Um, I guess I don't know if you all had introductions, but I'm I'm floating in the same waters as Marco, and maybe you did 15, went 10 years ago, and it, this is the stuff that kind of it's the material that religion is formed out of <laughs> so, I, literally and yeah. metaphorically, but it's, it's very yeah. powerful. It, yeah. Well, I, the word I always use to describe it is deep. You know, yeah. that, that, that's probably, it's, it's a terrible spatial metaphor. I know Gapeser would slap me up outside the ears for using it, but, but it, it really is because one of the things that it calls into question, well, how fundamental is fundamental? You know, how, <laughs> how basic is basic? I mean, what, where, where do things really, so we, we get back to this whole idea of, uh, of, of origins kind of thing. And, and so, you know, the first question that, that, that um, Marco brought up was, well, do I see any kind of relationship between what Gapeser was saying and what, what Stan is saying? You know, is there, you know, I really appreciate Gapeser. I think he has a wonderful model and a great tool to use to describe and talk about a lot of things. And, and is there any real overlap between them? And I think, I think the, what, what probably got me really started on this is a statement that Stan made in one of his book. And he says that what he's doing is he's trying to uh, understand what the original Hebrew or Aramaic text is saying by looking through the translations. And that whole looking through is is the Gapsarian idea of diaphaneity, what is the diaphanon, looking through to find out what, what is there regardless of what you think it means or how it is translated. We, we saw that there's, you know, there's probably, there's over 900 readings of the first text. That means there are at least 900 literal interpretations of the first uh, 28 letters of the text. But what are they all talking about? Regardless of how they say it, what are they actually, if, if language is a pointing to something else, if there's a reference and a referendum and that kind of thing, what is it actually pointing to? And that, that's what he was looking to get to, or that's what he's still looking to get to. And he thinks he's found it in this geometric metaphor. Well, if that is valid in all places at all times in this, this geometric metaphor itself, is relevant. Well, geometry, as I understand it, and I know that my understanding of it is certainly different than Sloterdijk's, because he brings this up right at the beginning of uh, Bubbles, when he talks about uh, the Academy of Plato, and anybody who doesn't understand geometry shouldn't even come in there. And he was willing to exclude more people than got in as it was. But, but to me, geometry is 
primarily, if not exclusively, about the relationships of parts to one another. Two lines come together and make an angle. Um, a bunch of lines come together and they make uh, a plane, or they cross and they make a plane. And if you take a plane and rotate it 90 degrees, you end up with a three-dimensional space. And it's all about how things relate to one another um, that the expression in geometry itself comes out. Well, what Stan thinks he's found is that is that this this three ten torus knots, the two torus, all of these mathematical topograph uh, topological terms that he uses to describe what he thinks that first verse actually reveals to us is in fact an unfurlment of the platonic solids that, that Plato talked about. We have them, they're there, people talk about them all the time, but he says, well, one actually leads to the next, and you can go from the point of the line to the tetrahedron to the to the icosahedron, the cube, to the up to wherever. And that all kind of spins along that 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 path of whatever it is, because the underlying metaphor that he says is, well, it's a fruit tree yielding fruit whose seed is within itself. It's a self-replicating system. That's and, and so the universe and being and all that is and all that we even um, can comprehend is, is kind of based on that idea. So if I may just interject right yeah. here, because there was okay. also a correlation between the way that Stan came to decode or begin to decode uh, the, the verse uh, mm -hmm. using a, uh, a, a, a base pair three type of yeah, math, right? And we, you talk, you, you explained this in the last yeah. call, but uh, I looked a little more into it and the connection between the, the codons in a sequence of DNA and how each amino acid is coded for in a particular codon. There's some similarities between yeah. the mathematical structure, the geometric structure of how uh, a, a text, uh, mm -hmm. either in the case of the you know, GATC chemicals or in the case yeah. of say, Hebrew letters, uh, code for, uh, indicate some mm. kind of uh, construction. Uh, yeah. So I, I just wanted to highlight that because that was yes. what, for me, made it very curious because if that were the case, then, I mean, if, if that uh, analogy uh, holds up, then there is some thing being coded for, presumably, in the text, yeah. not necessarily. Although it could, it could also include the, you know, the the specific mythic content of. of mm -hmm. the text. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that would be interesting to kind of yeah. noodle about is yeah. what is being coded for, uh, and where does that code come from? Because if it arrives in this form of a of a Bible of a, uh, you know, a complete text in some sense, mm -hmm. then. Uh, you know, and that, that arises historically in a certain window of time, yeah. Uh, yeah. which, you know, is not all at, at once. It's not like a, a novelist, you know, writing his novel in, in yes. a year or two. It's, it's, it's um, embedded with a people uh, and mm -hmm. the people kind of carry it forward, uh, transmit it, uh, copy it, uh, and also live by it. Although mm -hmm. they may not live consciously yeah. by the geometry uh, embedded in the text. However, there is a relationship there. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know that the idea of a covenant is you know, central to, yeah. to, to this particular story. There's a relationship there between those people and the creator of that language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I also <laughs> found it interesting that, that it was a base three kind of thing. Um, he tried, by his own admission, he tried every base that he could <laughs> possibly think of, and that was the one that worked. And, mm -hmm. it, and it does happen to fit very well with DNA is interesting because um, if you look at some of the other uh, pages on the, the sites that I, in the Meru site, for example, he does a really nice thing where he shows uh, Buckminster Fuller also came up with a 22, um, there's a 22 twist uh double helix kind of thing where he where he did it with tetrahedrons and that fit very well with what what um 
um, uh, Tenon was doing as well. And, and you can, you, there is, as far as Tenon is concerned, a direct relationship between how the text in Genesis unfolds and how DNA operates. Now, what that is specifically and, and how that functions, uh, you, you hit the nail on the head. That's something to noodle about because um, he's only trying to figure out, well, how does the text work? And he's leaving it to everyone else to figure out, well, how does that apply somewhere else? That means somebody else has to sit down and try and noodle through that one and see if they can come up with a relationship. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, when I was talking to him and he, he makes the case a lot of times, you know, there seems to be letter level coding in the New Testament, mm-hmm. but he's not going to touch it. And he's not going to, and his, the rabbis that he's working with, if they are touching it, aren't going to talk about it. I'm sure that they are doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that they're doing it because they can't be that not curious not to, but <laughs> because they've spent their entire historical cultural time dealing with this text. Mm-hmm. And so if this text has a relation to that text, they're going to look at that text. They've, all, they've always done that. I mean, he, he says that, you know, the primary le- uh, metaphor for um, Islam is learning. It's a, the Lamed. Lamed means learning. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's, that's kind of like, well, their contribution to the mix, because he always brings us back to the, uh, to the Abrahamic uh, um, uh, religions themselves. And Christianity is all about compassion and love and, and doing. So there's a, this action component and Islam means submission. And so there's, you know, finally su- submitting to the will of God. It's, we're showing you what it is, you know, submit to it. They're much more closely related than we would like to admit for the most part. But everybody has to keep up the appearances. And so I won't do that. Well, he says, if you want to figure out how that works in the New Testament, well, some Christian has to do that. He goes, if I, as a Jew, start talking about it, people are going to know what the hell does he know? Mm-hmm. Um, he's not. He's not part of this. You know, he's he's just he's trying to make it into something that isn't because he has an agenda or whatnot. Mm-hmm. And and that's that's the integrity uh, integrity that I see in Stan Tennant is he goes, okay, well, I'll leave my hands off of that. Mm-hmm. So he's not a biochemist and he's not a DNA and he's not a, a geneticist. And so he goes, well, it looks like it's there. Mm-hmm. It looks like that's happening, but I'm not. I, I'm not the guy that can do that. Right. Somebody I mean, that. we could speculate, though. Uh, yeah. At least here. Yes, we, I think we have to speculate, speculate. <laughs> before we can even come up with a program. Well, how would I go about figuring it out? Well, in cell biology, uh, we you know could look at a cell and, yeah. and you know as has been done to look at the mechanisms involved in the transcription. Yes. Of yeah. code into. For example, code. yes. And what are the other molecules that are involved? For example, mm-hmm. so we know that ribosomes are involved. RNA is distinct from DNA and they do different things. Would there be analogous structural, uh, you know, components in the way that a, a, a sacred alphabet or a sacred text mm-hmm. is transcribed uh, into yeah. form, into some yeah. kind of concretion? Uh, to not, to, you, you also, we were going in the direction of looking through and diathroneity. Yeah. So I didn't want, you know, I interjected yeah. there, but there was a, a direction you were going in with your with your noodle well that's the whole thing this would be a way to un- uncover or expose that diaphaneity if one could do if we could do that somebody has to be you know i i'm not capable of doing it you would need to have you need to have a, a geneticist or a, a microbiologist or a whatever to do that and the chances uh, and that, that's one of the problems that we have in the modern world is in order to do research, you need money. And in order to get money, you have to apply for a grant. Now, I can just imagine a grant reviews committee reaction <laughs> to somebody submitting, well, I think because in the book of Genesis, there's this uh, geometric uh, how do you do that's going on. And, I, and since there's probably a relationship to how DNA uh, combines with the elements, I'd like to explore that. And they're going to go, okay, yeah, you, yeah, go ahead, do that as much as you want, but not with our money. You know, it's, you, you kind of, oh, okay, I'm a little stuck right now. because You know, uh, Stan's found out everything he's found out because he had some patrons who would support him. But, you know. A man isn't getting rich off of any of that. <laughs> you know, I can tell you that because it's 
what what if what if it's true? See, that's the other side of the coin is always well, what if he's right? What what if you do find out that there's a direct relationship between what's written in the book of Genesis and the DNA? No. There, there's a I can I can imagine that there's would be something of a backlash for whatever reason. And because we don't that's not the first association that we would make. And we certainly don't want those guys having figured it out already. Well, well, Stan's not saying it. He goes, well, actually, it's been, been being said a lot of places. This is, we're back to arrival. You got 12 pieces of the puzzle out there. Maybe there's one puzzle, and I'm just giving it to you in different versions so that somebody gets one of them. You know, mm-hmm. Maybe that's how that, that, that works. You know, there could be something in, in that regard as well. So, but, but somebody has to be able to stand up and say, well, I'm willing to look at this, and that's really hard to do given the constraints that we have in our academic community. You know, the, the other thread that was on today, people, people who are scholars don't read because, in part, this was just a name of it, because I'm not really getting paid to read things. Well, shit, choose a different profession. You know, don't go into one that's, that's text-laden if you don't want to read. I'm sorry. You know, what are people who work 40 hours a week in the mine, what do they do? When they go home, well, sometimes they read. Gee, who's paying them? Nobody. And some of those people figure stuff out. You know, there's a. I ran into a lot of people who are very simple, everyday guy. The guy that I ran into that was probably the most informed modern person I've ever met on Kabbalah was a was a lab technician. You know, he he built models for people for scientists who couldn't figure out how to how to screw two pieces of metal together. Because they were so egg-headed, you know. But he knew a whole lot about Kabbalah. And he used to tell me all about, oh, they're doing this in the lab. And I can tell you this is how it's going to end up. And he was right a lot of times. <laughs> he was just looking at it a whole different way. I have but, a huh? couple, couple questions and then maybe a couple elements or one element to add into it. Kind of going back to Gebser. I, I haven't gotten around to the diaphaneus. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that comes in comes in part two. <laughs> gotcha. I, I kind of, I'm taking it very slow and yeah, yeah. That's obviously okay. it's been cut off. But yeah. so, does the alphabet that Stan Tenen is talking about that I, is there a di- diaphaneus alphabet? How do you, can you pronounce the word again? Di- well, it it all depends on who you're talking to, how we say <laughs> these things, you know. But it's diaphanous would be the adjective. Diaphaneity, I think, is how we. I'm sure people would say diaphaneity in, in some instances, but just how it's spelled, I, I go with diaphaneity. Okay, maybe I, I was looking at your blog the other day and maybe I mistook your, your, the name of your website or your blog, the diaphanon. Um, diaphanon is, kind of, yes, the I Greek the form. Form. Yeah. No, it's the Greek it's form of the word. Yeah, that's, that's why okay, that, okay, okay. yeah, yeah, so, that, that's where that came from. Yeah, the, the blog is very Gapeser inspired. So I guess my question for the two of you, which maybe you're getting around to it in a roundabout way, uh, how, so going back to the original question, the origin, uh, how does Gebser connect? And then I also wanted to throw in kind of going back to the, the code that was given, that this, this whole thing we're talking about here, and the transmission through generations. Yeah. And maybe that maybe that's where again I haven't read Gebser, but maybe the integral kind of model. Like obviously you can't transmit it directly to your child. Your child will not understand prayer in the way a full blown understanding adult will understand prayer. That is correct. That is so correct. It, it, the transmission obviously there's been from the time that the, the chosen people were given this information mm-hmm. for lack of a better term right now. Um, obviously, it's been kind of the translation has been lost either because yeah. we've lost our elders, which is very, that's kind of what I'm working with with Ann Roberts uh, thing there. I'm, um, so how, how do you feel that that ties in the intergenerational intergener- aspect, the integral levels up to the integral um, reaching that point where we can fully understand like we could we could be the animal that is already within that timeless 
this the spacelessness and now we're we're we have this material and what do we do with it what are we yeah, yeah. what are we going um, so how does that tie into gapes here well one one of the things that links gapes to me were and that's why I mentioned this unfurlment of the platonic solids, is Gapeser himself was very much against having his model being viewed as evolutionary or as a stage model. Um, to him, the, it's more of a consciousness unfoldment. It, as we move along, these aspects manifest, come to be as a part, of, they're kind of a natural sequence of what is preceded, and stages would imply I don't need what I had before. And Johnny is, uh, John's one of the, the people who, who brings this up again and again and again. We need the efficient phase. He, he has these efficient and deficient phases of every, every structure. But we need those efficient, magical, and mythical, and mental structures. Okay? Because we don't throw them away when they're done with them. They're an essential part of what we're doing. We're we're enhancing, we're expanding, we're unfolding from that. And so that, that comes with it. It's just like, it's like, and that's why the analogy with the, the tree bearing, bearing fruit whose seed is within itself, you know, the new pear tree is in the pear seed. It's, it's there. It doesn't get thrown away. It doesn't get super, it, it, it's not superseded only in form. It's not so I can plant the seed and I get a new tree and I get new fruit and it goes on and on and on and it continues. And the thing about Gapes' model is it's open-ended. And the thing about Young's model is it's open-ended because it's not one of these things that, that actually comes to completion. But it does take on different appearances and different expressions, different manifestations as we move along. So that's another point where I see that there's a you know, Gapeser is unabashedly spiritual. He says origin is spiritual, and whatever um, Stan is talking about that has left us this text, if that's, you know, which is as good as any way to describe that, um, it's, it's ever-present. It's always there. It's not, it's not going away. Um, people have been carrying it around for, for thousands of years and maybe not even knowing what they have. Uh, this is the thing that I've always found about that Rosicrucian mythology about the 12 uh, Rose Qua, who are on the, the you might not know that you are. You know, um, there are twelve bodhisattvas in, uh, in 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 Buddhism, but they don't necessarily know they're one of the bodhisattvas. You know, it's not the, it's not what you know that matters; it's what you are that matters. <laughs> and it's this idea, and the difference between what we think we are and what we are, and that's that is to me the the true ontology of of, of things. It's in the being itself, and 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 it's, it it may be independent of our own awareness or consciousness of it, as well. Just like whatever's in that text is kind of removed in a way from what we think's in the text. It, it it's just there, but when we discover it, we have to deal with it. So so I see I see very key parallels between what Gapeser was describing and what and what Tenen is implying, or at least saying as a result of what he's, what he's doing. So when we look at these integral structures of consciousness, there are, to me, three key notions that show up there. One of them is synerasis, one of them is stasis, and the other one is etiology. And, and he said, and, and Gapeser talks about um, cystasis, for example, and he says that's the, that's the, integrating dimension in which 3D, the spatial world is integrated to, into a whole in such a way that it can be stated directly. That whole idea about diaphaneity, uh, etiology is the term he uses to describe being in truth. It, it's just the way it is. It's not the finger pointing at the moon. It's, you know, it's the moon itself. It's the, you know, if you use the, the, the Zen uh, kind of thing. and 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 it reveals itself to us. You, you see it for what it is in the, in the truest sense of the word. And, and to me, when somebody says, oh, well, these letters kind of describe uh, the 27 dimensions of the standard quantum vector state or whatever it is, well, I don't know how much more fundamental you can get than that. That, that to me is, okay, well, this is how it is, you know. Live with it. And that, that to me is a statement of being in truth. 
Okay, now I may not like it, and I may not grasp it, and I may not grok it, and I may not whatever it is, but it's a pretty, <laughs> it's a pretty fundamental, I don't know how I should say it, and so that's the way he says it. And to me, that that's as close as I've seen in a lot of places for somebody speaking etiologically. And when he talks about um, cinerasis, for example, cinerasis is what what supersedes synthesis. In the old Deglian dialectic kind of thing, you have a thesis, antithesis, you bring it together, you have a synthesis. Well, that's a two-dimensional model. And what Gapeser is saying is, well, actually it's cinerasis, and you have things that are interacting, and out of any number of perspectives, a greater whole emerges. And it's always towards this wholeness that the integral consciousness is moving. And when things are whole, they become transparent. They become diaphanous. Diaphanous. You can see through them. You see them for what they are. In the in the Jewish and Kabbalistic tradition, the the tzaddik, the wise man, the righteous man, uh, the Hasid, he is uh, Kavaho. He his insides are like his outsides. He's transparent. What you see is what you get, if you can see anything at all. And that and that's why and that's why he's righteous. And that's why he probably is ignored in the world. You know? um, I, was, <laughs> I just read an article, I don't know where it was, um, on these Buddhist monks that turn themselves into light, and they're like bodies disappear. I don't know if you've, you've seen any of this. This is, this is really weird. You think this stuff's weird. Yeah, that's really weird. <laughs> and, and they can only do that by thinking loving thoughts for like 60 years. And then they get to this point, and they, they literally dissolve. You know, Literally. They showed a picture that one guy was left. It was just like his clothes, his hair, and his fingernails. That's all that was left. Okay. Well, I guess his insides were like his outside. We only saw the outside, but you know, we really didn't see the inside part of this. And this is that that whole idea of being to me of looking through things and things, seeing things. And so I, I, I feel a great affinity between the two. I have absolutely no problem trying to describe what Stan is doing in Gapesarian terms, or when people are. I'm discussing Gapeser, bringing in a little bit of Stan. Uh, one has to do it carefully and in small doses, of course, uh, to help uh, at least illustrate what it is that I'm talking about. And it's this whole idea of being in truth. Uh, how, how do you not point at the truth? How do you point the truth? Because there's no representation involved now. That's what Gapeser's, you know, we don't represent it in some way. We don't we don't describe it or whatever. It, it's there for the seeing. That's, that's this whole idea of verition. That, that, that's a word that will pop up a lot when you, you get back. He's, the neologism, neologisms will just increase as you get towards the back of the book. Because <laughs> he, keeps, he keeps making up words to try and describe what it is that he's talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, let me let me ask a, man, yeah. another yeah. question before we even move on to the set, to the next question in that cool. list because something comes out of this and I might be able to kind of step back mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know point uh, point to in this case a another kind of another shape or another correspondence yeah. uh, between Gibson and and uh, and uh, the Meru work. It, it, the title of Gibson's book is. Ursp I'm going to pull it up right here. Ursprung in Gegenwart. Ursprung in Gegenwart. Ursprung in Gegenwart, which is the English, which is translated in into English, not transliterally as the ever present origin. Yes. We had a discussion about this when we were reading uh, the ever, ever present origin, um, and had some, uh, and you had provided some illumination yeah. around, you know, the 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 etymologies uh, of those mm -hmm. words. So the Ursprung being the upspringing and Gegen, Gegenwort by itself is tra translated as presence. Yes. Or now in the book of Genesis, we have a book which is ostensibly about the origins mm -hmm. uh, and it is establishing the, the, the beginnings uh, of, of things, right? Mm -hmm. the, yeah. the world of everything. Uh, in, and then we have this historical process that unfolds from that beginning, starting with the story of Adam and Eve and mm -hmm. Abraham and, and so on. Gabeser gives us 
another kind of historical process, which is defined by these mutations of, of consciousness, or which mm-hmm. is looking at through these mutations of consciousness. But at, at, at base, we're talking about origin, mm-hmm. uh, or what springs from origin. Mm-hmm. And so, I'm, uh, uh, I mean, I get, uh, I, I'm, just, I'm noticing, I'm noodling, you know, on, mm-hmm. that, on that theme. And I think one of the questions I might ask has to do with how history plays a role in that, earth, that springing forth and in that, uh, that genesis process. Because if, hist- if, if presence is ever present, if the origin is, is, is ever present, ever present, then genesis is not just in the past. It's not just a beginning point from which we've departed uh, yeah. and uh, you know, have, uh, no longer have access to. Yeah. And so is there something in this text that is um, providing access to origin, uh, mm-hmm. the, the, that, from which gen- that from which genesis happens? Okay. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you about two Kabbalistic teachings. One of them is, What's described in Genesis is not something that happened sometime in the very far distant past, whether it be in geological terms or whatever. The Kabbalistic teaching is is that Genesis, uh, and here the the Gapesarian term does help, is ever-present because the universe is created, recreated anew in every moment. It's an ongoing, steady, standing, never-ending, so to speak, process. It's always happening. And it's happening just as now as it did when we read the story that said, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So that's, that, that's the one of them. It's, it is an ever-present creation. It's... That's why one of the things that uh, one of the models that the that, that tenant has, for example, is uh, the model of continuous creation. This is, this is a play on, on that very teaching. This is always going on at all times. It never stops because, and well, it brings up a couple of other things about the notions of analog and digital and continuity and, and um, uh, discreteness that, also end up playing a lot of role in, in, in what we do there. Mm. So, so that, that's the one side of it. And the, and the other one was, I lost my own train of thought. Um, you'd ask two things. I lost your train of thought too. <laughs> you lost my train of thought too. Uh, it'll Step come. back into the origin. Right. Access. Well, that, that, would be, that would mean then, if it is constantly being created, then origin is ever present. Because I do believe that what Gapser is calls origin, um, uh, Tenen would call Ein Sof or Hashem or however it is that we, we choose to put a label on whatever it is that we can't really label. And, you know, Gapser option for origin, Ursprung, it's, it's, you know, that or is, is really primal as far back as you can go you know, something started and that was this leap. And the thing was that it wasn't, he didn't like ease into the process. He didn't like, you know, you, and a, a jump is always a discrete motion. There's something discrete about it. It's just like, it's like uh, Jung's idea, you know, of light and the photon. Uh, Quant's, um, uh, Planck's quantum of action is discrete. It's, it's not analog. It, it kind of happens. Um, one of the big talks, uh, one of the big discussions in Kabbalistic and, and religious circles, and also be, especially when you're dealing with the Hebrew alphabet, is the first book of Genesis doesn't start with the first letter of the alphabet. It starts with the second letter of the alphabet. Mm-hmm. The first letter is, is an inter- Aleph in uh, Hebrew is an interesting letter because it has no sound. Uh, when you learn how, when you learn about Aleph, it's it's the sound you make before you make a sound. I don't know if you know what a glottal stop is. 
Uh, we don't use them a lot in English because we tend to, in French, don't use them at all because they run everything together. But but there are there are certain places when um, oh we do use one in in uh, in, uh, in English when we say uh oh between the uh and the o oh, there's there's kind of like a breaking off of the air you kind of like close your throat to you kind of stop the flow just really briefly and in that and that's that's the sound of aleph because aleph itself in some circles has the meaning of in indeterminacy it's Juarez, I mentioned him the last time in the cipher Genesis says that it is indeterminate life death it's everything and nothing at one time it is the absolute paradox of all paradoxes and it, this Aleph is what manifests itself in the world this is this is this is what actually is coming out in the back and when you look to the big people in history it's when 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 Aleph shows up then things really start happening um, Suarez's interpretation of uh, the life of Jesus is certainly not Albert Schweitzer's I can tell you that <laughs> because he's going, well, it was, it's right there. He's showing you, he's telling us, well, here I am. I'm here. Take a look. What's going on? But it's this is even it's, it's everything and nothing at the same time. We, because we've talked about this all. What is everything? And what's nothing. And, is it, we, you know. Just to jump to a uh, thought is, do you think, does Aleph have any correspondence to void? Well, in the, in the, the absolute death part, I would say probably, you know, <laughs> and in the absolute life part, not at all. No, because it's, it's, but the thing about it is it's, it's both at the same time. Hmm. It, it is really everything and nothing at the same time because there, and, but it expresses in some way when we, when you meditate on, if one would meditate on Aleph, for example, um, you kind of get you you get this whole and we've we've talked about this a lot here too this whole idea of how do i reconcile paradoxes in my my poorly equipped human mind uh, yeah, we, i was we going to say that it, it's just like the zen cone of what is the sound of one hand clapping one hand clapping for example yeah i think there's lots of ways to point to this and say okay well think about this for a while and 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 when we're reading young and he says you know well there's this quantum of action Okay, we can measure it physically, for example, but but that whole idea that that light is or isn't there, there's no like in between. There isn't like some little glow that starts, and then all of a sudden you see it. it's just it's either there, it's not there. You either have a photon or you don't. Either the wave collapses or it doesn't. So how does how, how does the how does the the, uh, the base three system? Yeah. relate to the binary system here then because the binary system gives us zero and one it gives us yeah, yeah, yeah. Route, well right i think we're going to get it also binary. gives us computer technology well it does and and that and that's that ties in very much with the next question that you asked which was how do these what's the relationship between encoding and shape and information you know what, what is it? I, I told you, I need to read Caravan again because she keeps throwing this word information around and I'm, I've got problems with it. Well, I, the reason I have problems with it is I don't always understand what people are saying when they're, when they're saying things. You know, I hear all the words and they, all the words make sense, but I don't know what they exactly mean. And this whole idea about this fundamental distinction, one way to describe that would be ones and zeros of IT. You know, John Wheeler said, you know, it leads to bit. That, that's all there is to it. You know, that being leads to it. And, and, and but Tenen is saying that this, he said this first distinction represented by the letter B at the beginning of the book called The Beginning, it's the same idea as the distinction that is implied in the concept of information because we talk about ones and zeros. And that everything exists as it does because it's different or can be contrasted with everything else. That whole idea of contrast is really important. Well, I, I pulled uh, Wiener or Wiener's um, the, the Human Use of Human Beings off the show. He was one of the big cyber. He's a guy, I think, that 
really started uh, cybernetics back in the 40s and whatnot. And he said that information is the name for the content of what is exchanged with out the outer world as we adjust to it and make our adjustments felt upon it. To live effectively is to live with adequate information. Thus, communication and control belong to the essence of man's inner life, even as they belong to his life in society. Well, that's kind of like what Tendon's saying, but it's not the same thing that Tendon's saying. But this idea about control is a, plays a really big role, for example, in Arthur Young's model. Because if you go once around, once, once you do that whole spin thing and go around, you know, the four quadrants, he's got that, you know, L, L cubed divided by T squared is control. It's, you know, changing velocity. So they're kind of talking about the same thing. And they're kind of on the same page as the other. And then Curry Van was the last one we read. And she said um, that information is what is conveyed or represented by a particular arrangement or sequence of things. That's her definition of it. Well, in this arrangement and sequence, oh, I'm back with Tenon. Because he talks about the arrangement and sequence. He says the, the, those letters show up in the text in that, that order. They have to be in that order. It doesn't happen. And so he's been, you know, trying to uncover why that order then does, does come about. So it's in that arrangement of things that the, that the information comes out. So we're all, they're all using the same words, but I'm not sure that that is the same thing as the difference between a spot on a flash drive or disc or whatever, a magnetic medium or a, a CD, a light medium that is magnetized or burnt and one that isn't. Mm -hmm. I know that I need that distinction in order to do that. But... I haven't gotten to the point where I, I've understood or, yeah, that I understand that those are the same things. One of them, the last one, this digital registration thereof seems to be, in my mind right now where I am on January 23rd, 2018, a representation of the other, mm -hmm. but not the same thing as the other. So I think it's a way to express it, but it's not necessarily it. That's, mm -hmm. that's the problem I'm having right now, whereas Tenen is saying, oh, by the way, when you point like this, you're pointing it. Mm -hmm. See, that, that, that's, that's where I'm, I'm wrestling right now for me. So I think the, you know, the question is extremely poignant and to the point. And because, well, is it? Is it the same? I don't know. I, I just picked up, uh, I've had it laying around the house for a long time, but it's a book called Deco Decoding the Universe by Charles, mm -hmm. Charles Seif or Seife. Uh And I'm not very far into it, but one of the fun assumptions that he's, more than assumptions, claims he's, he's uh, working with uh, in this book is that information, uh, what we think of information, of as information is is not just the representational mental uh, system or schema that we may mm -hmm. uh, use, or you know, in the lay just sense yeah. of information, information overload, data, etc. But is he says a physical property of the universe? So it's not; it's actually there. Okay, uh, and um, that's I believe as well what uh, Jude Caravan is working with. I haven't come to ha in what sense is it there. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, a little mm -hmm. bit I've read about, say, quantum computing, is that the states of the, you know, the, of the particular particles that you're using to store or to, to transform information are related to the spin of the particle and various things that I, I just haven't learned enough uh, yeah. about. Um, but the idea would be that that it's there now. Quantum information is different. Quantum level or quantum stored information is different than uh, binary information because it, it doesn't only exist in those two states of off or on. It can be off, on, off and on, not neither off nor on. It's like tetra. It's a tetra lemma, tetralemic, if mm -hmm. you know, to coin a, a, a word. Um, 
just uh, set of possibilities or um, s- schema. Uh, and um, the que- I mean, one question that kind of comes up for me, uh, in so, and particularly insofar as we've been talking about AI and about uh, our, uh, you know, how, um, you know, h- how, how the computer, the information <laughs> revolution uh, that is going on now uh, is affecting consciousness mm-hmm. and is um, kind of making uh, claims to the dominion, we might say, of, of consciousness, the, the primacy, you know, of consciousness compared to its representations or replications or mm-hmm. virtualizations, uh, like that there's a, there's a struggle uh, going on there. Uh, mm-hmm. And, it, and it, it almost might seem that there's a struggle between different information paradigms. Uh, and that, you know, if, if you look behind that, that struggle to the actors or the agents who are uh, involved, uh, maybe sometimes even unwittingly, uh, that it, it could be seen that this note that uh, I'm just jumping around here, I realize mm-hmm. this, I hope it ties together that there is a struggle for control between and within you know, within the, the binary systems, but also between binary and, uh, you know, tr- tr- I don't know, trini- trinary, trinitarian type, type <laughs> logics. Mm-hmm. I don't know exactly. Like here is where mm-hmm. I, my head starts to uh, discombobulate a little bit uh, because uh, I sometimes feel like we're sort of in this space of being kind of caught in the real, tensions uh, at least minimal uh, between those different domains and so uh, you know to <laughs> to get back to I guess the paradox is that um, ultimately they w- wouldn't be truly uh, separate or truly in conflict because they would be part of the same everythingness that mm-hmm. is uh, arising right so we'd have to resolve them into some unity into some into some one but it's not really a one that can be considered to be static in any way it can't really be c- enclosed uh within a single system a single understanding uh because then it would destroy that uh action that action ac- that that activity of of differentiation and distinction and flow that makes the whole thing run. But again, this is beyond my pay grade. <laughs> this is where, where we're going uh, with this. Uh, I uh, I also had another part to that question, though, which may help to um, maybe ground where that notion of struggle comes in or why it would be relevant. And, and that was the question of whether you believe uh, that the shapes or numbers are inherently ethical, or is there something inherent, mm-hmm. inherently ethical about them? You touched on this last time, but I, I think right. it's—I uh, think we could maybe take it a little bit further. Um, that was the—that was the the question. Let, let, me, let me first link back to what you just said. I, I couldn't agree with you more. That is, you describe what I, the dilemma that I'm going through. I don't know what people mean when they use it. Is it the same thing? Is there something different about that? Are we really l- looking at the same phenomenon that we're trying to describe? Um, and that's, that's why, for me, it's so, so confusing sometimes because everybody that uses it, whether it's Curry Van or Wiener or any of the – or Kelly or – or courts file, it doesn't matter. They all talk about it as if they know what they're talking about. But I don't know what they're talking about. I don't know really what's going in the, on in their mind because they're using a word that does take on a lot of different meanings and representations depending on how it's being used. So that, that's been for me for the last few years, at any rate, really one of the things that just, you know, it just bothers the dickens out of me. That's why I said I, it was really nice when I read Curry Van's book, but I'm going like, I have, I have to read this again. I hate having to read things again, but all right. Okay. But I have to read it again 
because I think she's a little closer to what the other one was. And then when I was trying to noodle through what we were doing, I pulled the wiener off the shelf and then oh, no, I got to look at him again too. It's like, oh shit, I, just, I never stopped looking at people again, you know, because I have to figure out well, what it is that they, that they're really saying. So, um, I think I think we need to note that, and and be aware that you know you you and I are actually trying to to to, to chew through the same curmudgeon, <laughs> you know, in in that regard. Because I think it is very fundamental to what happens thereafter. Where where does that lead? Depending on where you start. And that's the, the, all the talk that I've always had about your presuppositions and your assumptions will determine where you're going to go. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and this is a very fundamental one. And I'm not always sure you can't all, I haven't been able to dig out of some people what it is that they're actually, where they're actually coming from. But your other question about, is there something fundamentally ethical? <laughs> they say, oh, that's the short form of it was the one that probably uh, caused the most consternation and the most noodling over the week because um, it's, it's, such, it's such a fundamental question. It, it's really fundamental. And when, when uh, uh, Tennant says in a, uh, one of the places, he says, um, it's our speculation that the principles that lie behind the formation of the gestures encoded in the alphabet reflect universal principles that underlie all being. Okay, so that's we're, we're kind of back to that statement. Okay, this is the etiological statement. It's this is the this is the being part, not just but it's being in truth because it's also factually accurate kind of thing. And he says that they embody fundamental principles of nature or the fundamental principles of nature of being that are universal, universally ethical, social, and physical. He, he also says that. So I'm going, okay, well, what, const- what constitutes um, ethics, so to speak? And, and that, that was another place I'm going, well, I know a lot of, we all talk about morals and ethics, and, well, but what, what is that, actually? I was reading in uh, Technosis today, I don't know if you've ever read it, Eric Davis's uh, kind of description of Silicon Valley and how much all of this kind of weird thinking flows in and is behind a lot of what goes on there kind of thing because because that comes up as well and, and what we find especially with people like Kurt Spall and Kelly or whatnot um, this was also Metzinger brought up the same thing in the podcast that, that Doug brought up um, an advanced enough AI is inherently benevolent and I'm going okay well where do you get that where does that come from why would it be I, I see AI as a product of the human desire, will, endeavor, or whatever it is. I think we've got our fingers so far in that, that, you know, we'll never get them out again. And I've never seen anything in the history of humankind that was inherently ethical. There have been inherently ethical people that have been running around. I, you know, Buddha might be that way. And, you know, Zoroaster might be that way. And all those people, we go, oh, geez, we can't be like them. They're, you know, demigods or gods or whatever it is. But but they keep telling us, well, you don't have to be, is what I keep hearing them say, well, you don't have to be that way. I, I know you're that way, but you don't have to be that way. There's nothing that compels you to be that way. The, the Israelites wandering around in the desert, if you read the Old Testament, just at the story level, is, the, is, is a 2,000-year document or a 3,000-year documentation of people that kept losing the plot. Well, here it is. Okay, got it. And two generations later, no clue <laughs> what's going on. Well, uh, Yahweh shows up and kills a few people, wipes out the planet, whatever it is that he has to do to get their attention, you know, and said, okay, okay, well, we got it. We'll do it again. And then uh, two generations later, nowhere, nothing. I'm going, well, if I just take it at the story level, I'm not, I'm not sure we're getting it. You know, we're not, we're not grasping what's going on. If it's right there in front of our eyes, why don't we see it? Well, maybe we haven't been able to. This is the one thing. This is this is the this is kind of like the comfort I get from Gapeson. He says, "Well, we weren't really ready to get it yet. We've been going through this whole thing to get to the place where we can get it." 
Young kind of says the same thing. Yeah, you go through this whole thing. You take a turn around the crystals and you head back up the other side of, of, the, of that V-shaped path in order to, to you know, to get it. <laughs> Doug's, you know, the ultimate perfection of the, you know, the potential. Okay. I, I, think, I think we can get it. I, I don't think, you know, there's anything inherent that we can't. But we don't. We just don't. <laughs> And I'm, and I'm, that's and I'm, kind of what I'm getting at is, can we even imagine it? Well, this right. is the thing. You see, that, that, those are re- and those are reasonable questions. You know, can we even imagine? It? And and one of the things that Ten- Tennant says, well, we'll kind of go this way. He he calls these first principles that we're talking about golden rules. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But but if we if we just kind of follow the logic that he said that whatever it is that the letters represent. They're encoded in a language, their own language, because they tell you what it is and how it functions and how it, it works. It's not our language. It's its, it's language. So we need it to get into that on the one hand. But language in and of itself, just the, the, the notion of language presupposes an other. There's no reason to talk to yourself. I mean, I do it all the time. I'm, I don't know if you guys do. I do it all the time. I'm generally in agreement with what I have to say, but sometimes I really get pissed off at myself because I realize that I'm not doing what I thought I was going to be doing. But it's this whole idea I have to communicate with someone or something else. There's an interaction with, and this is a whole idea of distinction to begin with, date. There's an inside and an outside. There's a, this and a that. So what... I have at least two. I don't have a unity any longer. I have a multiplicity. This multiplicity is expanded into a whole lot of things that we have now. So I'm always, always dealing with something else. So there's always another with which I must engage. That, that to me, is one of the very fundamental principles under that. The extremes of that is there's the one, the, the Israelites, the Muslims, Christians, as the one God, whatever that might mean. Um, it's, I find it interesting in the Old Testament that there's Elohim in Genesis 1 and there's uh, Yahweh in uh, Genesis 2, um, because they represent both sides of this coin, the one, this coin, the one and the many. So we're always dealing with this interaction between this one, this unifying principle, origin, if you will, and the many. So... In some way, I always have to interact with another. And that is an inherent principle of this whole language that's being shown to us in Genesis. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> that, that is an ethical dimension. That, that, uh, uh, thank you. That, that was my point. So that's what, where it becomes ethical. It's about ethics to begin with. It, it's so fundamentally ethical. <laughs> It's, it can't be anything other, so to speak, because we have to figure out how we do that. Now, an interesting thing he pulled, brings out in a little side article that he wrote once was about golden rules. That notion, what we say, you know, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, they're phrased a lot of different ways. Um, uh, the, the Jews say, uh, don't do to people what you don't want them to do to you. They, they express it in a negative form. But every religion, every belief community on the planet, even, even the atheist, if you take Kant as a basis with this categorical imperative, has one fundamental precept that is the same as the precept in every other one of them. They, they, they differ in all the details, but at heart, they all have the same idea of that as a British comedian, was it? Jim Jones, John Jones? I think his name is John. I don't know. Don't be an asshole. You, know? you, you, have, you have to get along with others. You have to be able to deal with others. It's not just you. And so that this universality is built into It can't just be any one thing. There's always another. There's always something else. And with this something else has to be dealt. We have to engage with that. And so I think in its very nature, it is an ethical system to begin with. 
That, that's the conclusion that I kind of came to from all my reading. What I, what I found interesting, there was a quote that uh, Tennant had, so indulge me just for a second. He says, we argue that the text of Genesis records a choreography for a dance of gestures to be performed by the human hand, a dance that not only has sacred, that is, spiritual and experiential significance, but when performed properly, would lead the dancer to a personal experience of the transcendent, even the experience of ego, death, and rebirth. And I found in, Feuerstein wrote about Gapeser, since we were on Gapeser and Mira a little earlier, I found, I found this kind of interesting. The breakthrough into the integral or aperspectival consciousness requires the persistent and, cons consist persistent and consistent application of oneself to the rendering transparent of the human personality so that consciousness can coalesce, grow together with the spiritual. Gapeser speaks of this task as our inner commission, a commission that goes beyond us. In other words, self-transcendence is the essence of human existence. Conversely, to be aware of these contexts, but not to engage in the work of self-transcendence, is to actively deny one's humanity. And I found those two statements to be very similar in intent and expression. I, we, we all have to get over ourselves. Because, because it's not about us. <laughs> it's about not just the other, it's because there are, besides us, only others. That, and, 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 it's, and it's so simple, it's so easy to lose sight of, so to speak. And it's so much work that nobody really wants to have to do it. I think this is why the Hermeticists in the Middle Ages called it the great work. Not because it was so profound, it's just because there was a whole lot of it. You know, but this is, this is an, a never-ending wrestling with oneself to be more than oneself, but not for one's own sake, but for the sake of everything, of everything, not just of everyone, but everything else in the multiplicity. So I, I, I do think, you know, the short answer to your question is, well, yeah, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> the long answer is, yeah, prove it. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, I'm oh, reminded, the, yeah, I'm reminded of the movie Arrival again because uh, this may be putting it somewhat simplistically, but it did require, and it required two things. One is some kind of crisis, mm -hmm. uh, the intruder uh, being the intruders being the the, the ships that that come down. Uh, this precipitates and provokes a fear response amongst the military industrial com complexes of you know, the various nations of, of the earth. Uh, and that comes to a head with almost, you know, a, a total breakdown of communication between the different sites uh, and almost a initiation of hostilities or aggression toward the messengers. Uh, uh, but again, spoiler alert, it's resolved when they're able to, put their minds together and realize mm -hmm. that they each have a piece of what is a universal language. So you could say that, I mean, maybe the ethics is not in the shapes themselves or in the numbers themselves seen as objective uh, qualities, mm -hmm. uh, but in the, um, <laughs> in the genius, uh, so to speak of, of their dissemination, because <laughs> this might be to go as well speaking to something Doug uh, has brought up a couple times because it, it sort of forces everybody, forces the world in, in this film uh, to work together uh, to figure it out. And once they do, then suddenly, you know, they can get to, the, they can go to the next level. Mm -hmm. They're they're able to participate in, uh, you know, larger, uh, larger holes and larger, you know, forms of um, exchange and communion and interaction uh, with these, with these beings who have come. Um, so it's inherent in, not, not, not again, like it's inherent in the, mm -hmm. like in the giving 
the, yeah. the transmission, uh, the process uh, by and through which people come to uh, an understanding of or clarity about what is going, like what they're carrying and how it relates to what other people uh, are carrying. Uh, and I think that's really interesting. <laughs> um, no, I, I do as well. That's why I'm, uh, you know, I keep making little tick marks here for every time you mention something, it gives me a reason to take a look at the movie. Yeah. <laughs> well, like I said, from a film critic's perspective, I, I think I had some issues with it, but yeah. uh, just that the ideas um, obviously are, are relevant here. I've also thought, wow, that's really ingenious. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and if if you were to want to communicate then you would have to sort of communicate on that level or communicate in those terms like you'd mm-hmm. have to sort of un- decode and then show prove that you've understood by uh, maybe repeating back something uh mm-hmm. reciprocating like there has to be some uh gesture yeah uh, and we can it's interesting we can call it a gesture yeah, yeah. even uh that uh, is kind of like the the return to that ping, you know, like, right? Mm-hmm. It lets the other know that you are there, mm-hmm. and you've heard them, and that, uh, you know, th- that, that, that they could respond now to you, that, that, mm-hmm. that there could be commerce between you. Yes. Uh, so how would we do that if we wanted to yeah. make a communication? Yeah, I, I, that I, is the I question. That's why, you know, the the inverse of that that same that's why I mentioned Flatland the last time because that's that's basically the premise although it's in two D three D I don't think it's any difference between two D two dimensions and three dimensions it is between let's call ourselves four dimensional beings so that we can flatter ourselves in, in a five dimensional mm-hmm. or unflatter space ourselves that, yeah or whatever you know <laughs> that, that the Sefer Yetziva is telling us that is is around us. You know, because it, it, it's that kind of thing. It's we we just we can't relate to it. You can't tell the flatlander look up. It doesn't mean anything. So, but but some way you have to be able to do that. Now, one of the one of the things that that um, um, a Tendon does is a print a point that shows up and and comes up in some of his later works is the idea of rhythmic traversing, going back over the same path. He, I'll, I'll put it in really crude terms, but if you pass the sphere. In, in honor of Mr. Slaughter. But if you passed a sphere through Flatland, Flatlanders would see a point that went to a line that went back to a point. That's all they would see. Because they're just there. So they, they see a line. And, and everybody sees a line. <laughs> no matter where they are in Flatland, they're around the sphere. They, they see a point go to a line, come to a point. And the idea is that by doing that on a regular and recurrent basis, it dawns on someone that there's more here than just a point the line, point the line. You, in, you intuit, if you will, that there's something higher. And so this notion of rhythmic traversing, um, he, he says, for example, is one of the reasons that the Jews read the Torah from front to back every year. Well, you read it once for every year. They go to the front, they go to the back. They read it. There's a set in how it's done, and it's done every year. And on the same days, the same thing's read, and they, they do this again and again and again and again. Maybe sometimes it works. Maybe sometimes it doesn't. You know, Some people get it. Some people aren't going to get it. Um, other people, he sits down in his apartment and goes, eh, I think there's something in this text. Uh, there's more here than just you know, a bunch of squigglies on the page. Okay, so he, he takes another approach to get in and goes, oh, I think I can see something in it. But... This whole idea of rhythmic traversing, because that brings me back to this dance of the letters. If you choreograph this, if you keep going over this day in and day in, day in and day out, he goes, and if you do it right, if you do it often enough, you keep this up. This is kind of what all the great religious traditions, the, the Buddhist monks that turn themselves into light and shrivel up and go away uh, physically, uh, do that because they do the same thing over and over and over and over and over. In the same way, at the same pace, at the same time, they just—it's it's, and then it's in this—it's in this movement that, that that comes about. Now, whether or not I wanted to dissolve into—you can put me in a mason jar. I don't think that's my goal. 
but uh, yeah. I don't think meat and potatoes is going to dissolve into light. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that it's water. And I think that's all part of the process. But this this whole idea of, of maybe we're being given clues for how do we do that? You know, I don't know exactly what they are. That's one thing that he said. And so it kind of sits in the back of my mind and I have it there every time I read through what he's talking about and what we might be able to do with it or what it means, because he's still trying to describe it in some way that makes sense to, to third parties. I think like what you're saying, um, it is going to take the intersubjective realm and with not necessarily, we don't need technology. We don't need this speed, but the speed is a factor right now of just, there are too many books to keep up with, so yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I can come to you for a summary of this, and I hope to give summaries of my own perspectives, and mm -hmm. it, it, it's going to take the most open minds that it, it'll take the greatest minds, but at the same time, it'll take those of us that are sci-fi writers that mm -hmm. just have some mm -hmm. random idea, and then that pops, and but just this constant living in the movement, living in those motions, and yes. it again and again, and it'll be occurring and reoccurring and anything we see, we might even look outside and see a tree and the wind is blowing it and just the same motion that my hand just moved. And I'll say, yeah, I, am, I am the tree and they're the roots and mm -hmm. um, just realizing so many things all at once gives us a sort of step into the realm of what God was thinking or the trend. How to, become, how to become just fingernails. And, uh, <laughs> like, I, I, I just like it in a very, it, to me, it's a very neutral term. It's not neutral, but it's, it's, it's transcendent. It's, it's just something other than me. That is probably, it's qualitatively different than me. We'll put it that way. It's not greater, it's not less. It's qualitatively different than I am, and I can engage that. That's, and, and that's what I also hear a lot of religious traditions saying. You can do it in meditation. You can do it in this. You can do it by dancing the letter. Everybody's kind of got their, their ways of doing it. And we try some of them. A lot of us, you know, I've, I've been a, a religious tourist ever since I left uh, Western Pennsylvania. You know, so I've gone through, you know, lots of these realms. And everybody's kind of got something. And you can try it for a while. And sometimes you have some success and sometimes you don't. And if you don't, you move on to something else. And so I ended up back with, you know, the Old Testament and came across tenants simply because I was looking for something closer to home. I had done a little wandering. I said, well, okay, it's not, it's not doing it for me, although it was in a, a moment of Zen meditation that I had probably the, you know, the key experience to change the whole direction of my own life. But it wasn't done in the, it wasn't done the way they said it would it should happen. You know? I kind of like picked up on things that they did and said, okay, well, I'll try that and see how far I get. So all we can do, all that we can do is try or wants to. I think that's the, the first start. A lot of people just don't want to. Yeah. I, this brings back the ethical dimension for me. <laughs> um, just, so, so there, there might not be the 12 negative dudes hanging out out there, the sages um, or dudettes, yeah. sorry, uh, that are, that at least for us as humans, maybe mm -hmm. in the whole scheme of things, there, there must be some sort of non-being, the, the void, there must be the negative um, for the scheme of things. And we'll, we can always take that into our being since we are beings mm -hmm. but and to to take that at least for us people for us humans to interpret yeah. the code that's coming in mm -hmm. to to see this the higher ethical dimension we we do we, we can accept the if, if our world was a my, my very first idea in philosophy 101 in college uh, that I came up with myself uh, on my own was the idea of a utopia for each individual. It's not going to be a utopia. Mm. This is, I'm Doug thinking here, but yeah, uh, we can put all the killers in that one spot that they want to be in and uh -huh. have it and do whatever they want. We'll, we'll live over here. And of course that's not going to work out, but uh, just that idea of we, we must 
encapsulate everyone within this realm. Um, so I don't know how this ties in. With <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I think it has to do. Element. It, it does have to do with the relationship between the part and the whole. Yeah, uh, and just how exactly we um, think about that. Um, mm -hmm. When I, I I was in medit I was meditating the other night, and I have been experiencing this waking up in the middle of the night. I don't tend to sleep through the night, um, which is you know good and bad. <laughs> but the, the, you know the, you know the bad part. The good part is that it's a good time to meditate. <laughs> and the phrase came into my mind uh, exactly this. And I'm not even sure I, I believe that the whole phrase is true or that I agree with it fully. Uh, it's more been a meditation for me. Uh, but the phrase was the integral is a function of belonging, not of exclusivity. The integral uh, or integrality, it may have been like a variation uh, that, that occurred as well. A function of belonging, not of exclusivity. And to me, when you create a totality, you're creating an exclusivity. Uh, between what's inside and what's outside of that totality. And so if you define integrality in terms of a totality, then you're always going to end up with the remainder, which is what's excluded from the, the whole. This was the point that's also made in the, the video clip on um, Sri Aurobindo's uh, integral uh, you know, praxis. Mm -hmm. uh, however, another way of understanding integral, the word integral just in English is that is, is, is that it's something that it's essential to. So something that's integral is integral to something. It's integral to a whole. Uh, and therefore to be, to have integrality or to be integral is not necessarily to be representative of, or constitutive of a to of the whole, but rather to be a part of the whole. So there's a relationship there between the part and the whole. Um, there was another piece too I wanted to touch on. And if we were to try to end this in 10 minutes to keep it at under two hours, which I think is fair, mm -hmm. um, I, I'd want to also touch on the question of the word, the logos, yeah. in the beginning of the logos. But before we get there, okay. and, and I think we can get there through this, this little bypass or this little detour, put the, the essay I posted earlier on the forum in praise of not not reading. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was... Cr cr criticizing or uh, responding to a piece. It, it was by a uh, uh, person named Sheila Limming, but it was responding to a piece uh, by Amy Hungerford in the Chronicle of Higher Education called on, on Not Reading or on the Refusal to Read. And there was a, I think that uh, there was something kind of disingenuous or uh, problematic about Amy Hungerford's uh, argument, which I went back and, and looked at. Um, but there was a germ of truth in it. I mean, she seemed to be rationalizing like this, you know, her, her desire not to read Infinite Jest by David Foster Wallace. And, you know, how do you just not reading uh, something was, I think, the question. But the, the germ of truth was that in, in a situation of abundant information uh, and of an abundance of pot potentials, I mean, there's you know, we'll, we'd have to live how many lifetimes to read all the books that are on our lists and to listen yeah. to all the music and et cetera. One does have to discriminate, right? And one ha does have to discern what's worth reading and what's not worth reading. And I think that part of Amy Hungerford's point was that we should not make those decisions simply based on the opinion uh, of others or the opinion of a, what she termed a literary establishment or, or the, even the market. Uh, that there should be some better reason, uh, and I don't know whether her reasons are better or not, um, but the point I understood was some other criteria for deciding to commit those precious hours that one has in, in, a, in a day or in a lifetime to the deep engagement with the text. Uh, and so, I mean, that that is something that, you know, I constantly have to grapple with because I'm, I'm surrounded by books, a wall full of books, books piled up next to my bed, but, you know, uh, and only so much time. Uh, and then there's all the stuff on the forum and, and reading what everyone, you know, what you all have to say, which I prioritize because I, well, because the, the, you know, what I've come to is that there's some way in which a text tells you kind of what to read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
once you're sort of when you're in uh when you when you're in that um progress when, on that journey uh that there's a reason why one thing happens after another uh and why one book appears or compels you or calls to you rather mm -hmm. than another and it's important to be able to tune into that so that you're reading in a way that leads you towards a broader and deeper understanding rather than uh, perpetuates a script that you may have internalized from, you know, some other kind of source of, of, uh, of uh, you know, authority or power or uh, desire. Um, so the way, the way that relates, though, is because the, the first words in the book of uh, the Gospel according to John are, in the beginning, this is another kind of Genesis story, but it's very sh short. It's just the first paragraph or two. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And, uh, and so we have now the introduction of logos into, mm -hmm. the, into the mix of these, these, um, in this conversation. When, la when we did it at first last week or a couple weeks ago, and you mentioned the, the, um, the way that these different Genesis stories, and there are two, you said, in the book of Genesis correlate mm -hmm. to each other or recapitulate the same patterns. And so I wonder if there is a relation between that latter New Testament version of Genesis and these, and, uh, and, and what I guess we could ask, like what it me would mean to, to read, to read the, the logos uh, in this sense of, in this sense of not just the fashion of literature, but mm -hmm. the, the, the meaning of being <laughs> uh, or the meaning of something transcendent. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's probably the question. See, if, if Tendon is to believe, and be believe, and I think that he is, and he said that there is also letter level coding in the New Testament, at least in the Gospels, John's one of the Gospels. It's the last one. It's, it's, it's very different than the other, the, the, you know, the four Gospels that are there. Three are called syncretic Gospels because they more or less tell the same stories. But um, uh, the Gospel of John is a very structured, very different kind of, uh, kind of text. Um, it has, it, it's a very seven-ish kind of text. There, you know, there's seven miracles that are performed and seven healings that take place. And there's, there's all kinds of sevens. And it's, it's you know, it's a very very structured kind of thing, but that, that doesn't really bother me so much because if there is this coding, then it's there as well, or it could be discovered. And if it is, it's probably pointing to the same thing. But that's beyond whatever, whatever translation we think those words mean. Now, the New Testament haven't been written in Greek. Uh, I was trying to put another a little talk together, and I, and I realized that um, in very simple things, there's there's different. This is, there's a story in all of the testaments about a man who's paralyzed and gets healed when he gets in Jesus's presence. And two of the stories, he gets lowered through the roof of the house, and he's told, "Take up your mat and walk." That, that's basically the the reason that this, that phrase is you know part of what everybody knows. They just don't know where it comes from. Well, in Matthew and in John, Jesus just happens to be there. And the other two, in, in Mark and Luke, the person is brought to Jesus, and he's brought through the house. But the word for mat and bed, or whatever it is, is different in the Gospels, and what's used for the roof is different in the Gospels, and how they go about it is different. So there's, there's all these little different details, just like we would have in Genesis 1, where we have the creation of the earth, and in Genesis 2, then we have the creation of man in the Garden of Eden and whatnot. So we do have differences in details, but they're basically pointing at the same thing, and they're related in some way. So if, if, in fact, this coding is there, and I don't know if it's there because I haven't been able to research it, but let's assume that it is, and it's probably pointing at the same thing. The problem that we have with the text, I find, is that it's been, just like Genesis has, theologized for, for generations and centuries, and everybody's got, got an agenda when they go in there because the word logos itself is one of those words that can mean everything and nothing. But if we look at upon, upon it as a general ordin, um Ordering principle, which also has to do with logic, logos, as a narrative ordering principle. In that regard, it has a whole lot to do with that first one. But the fact that we say in the beginning was the word and the words with God, we simply assume 
it's not stated in the text that it was spoken. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't say that it was. It just said it was there. <laughs> and it was a light that shineth in the dark. And see, so it might be. Ten says, oh, it says there, you know, God said, let there be light, and there was light. But it's not really about his speaking. It's, so the speaking part isn't the important part. It's the actual doing part that's, that's important. And that would, that would tie back in with this prologue to John, because it's the doing. It's there. It's, it's, it's really, it's a state of existence. Because, you know, it's, it's just the first five verses of that. And it said that all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made. Now, that little line in there is the one where most Christians say, ah, and he's talking about Christ. Well, he doesn't say it. You've, you've put that in there. All that it says there is all things were made by him. The word logos has a masculine gender in, in Greek. So, okay, it would naturally be because him, that it that we say in English is him in most other languages or her, just like in, in German, you know, mm -hmm. ceiling yeah. is feminine and the, the floor is masculine and the walls are feminine, but the door is feminine and the fence and the windows neuter and, you know, they, they have different kinds of genders for things, but it's still it, mm -hmm. we would say. It. So when we get to the translation, there's always a whole lot that's been cut, cut out. But it does relate light to this as a basic fundamental principle, light that shineth in the darkness. And it's been the nice thing about this was the last line, in the, in the darkness comprehended it not. There all of a sudden we have an it. <laughs> because it was the light. But you see, that's, that's the English speaking not necessarily the Greek, which would see that a little different. So I think they're related, and they could very well be related, but we've got to cut through layers and layers and layers of theological and Christological interpretation in order to get to it. And that's the hardest part to do, because that's part of our culture, is that that's all been laid on top of us. Mm. So we have to sort through the detritus and get down to the heart of things and we dig and dig and dig and dig. And that's why I'm always, uh, help. I'm always glad when somebody says, Oh, well, why don't you read this? If I respect and admire the person and, and think, okay, well, he's got a, you know, his head screwed on halfway straight. I'll take a look at it, but I'm certainly not adverse to, you know, I'll read the first chapter or the introduction, the preface, look in the index and I'm going, no, this isn't going to do it for me. Boom. Off it goes. You know, I'm I'm very hardcore when it comes to that. There's just some things like I'm not I can't do it. I don't have time. I'm not reading that, but I can usually tell you why I'm not. Mm -hmm. Not just because I think you know. In the end was Ed's decision. Yeah, well, you know, see if, if I'll tell you one thing that would probably gotten me to read Globes if there had been an index. <laughs> I'm serious. There's no index. And if you don't have an index, you don't want people to find shit. You know, it's like, okay, obfuscate on your own. I don't have time for obfuscation. That, that's, about, that's my little personal two-line reaction. Huh? So we're yeah. working on indexing on the, uh, the site. Yeah, even, even a crappy one. <laughs> Curry Van is probably the worst index I've ever seen in a book, ever. It is just the crappiest index ever. But at least she has one. <laughs> okay, you get points for that. You tried. It failed miserably, but you tried. <laughs> okay. So I need tables of contents, and because that's how I that's how I read books. I always go through all that stuff that's written in small print on the on the book reviews, table of contents, preface, translators' notes, blah blah. You know, not the introduction to the text, the translators' introduction, and the one in the back, and then that'll tell me whether I'm even going to read chapter one. Hmm. But that's just my own thing. That's the way I go. In. Yeah, and people are different. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and I'm glad that they are because when I see other people, you know, going through stuff and reading it, just like, you know, with the, with the Globe stuff, I'll skim, I'll skim through that. You know, I, I'm not going to read. I don't read it in detail because I don't know exactly in detail what you're talking about, but I can get, I feel I can get the gist of what it is that's coming across and then I can kind of keep up with what you're, what you're thinking. And and that's important to me because I can see how, how you folks are, you know, moving along with this. And I'm I'm really pleased when people get a lot of stuff out of other stuff. I think that's great. Just not I got other I got other things on my plate I gotta deal with. Don't we all? Only so much time. Yeah. And there's only yeah. 
Unfortunately, I was born into a world that has only 24 hours in a day. Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't sleep a lot. You, know, you wake up in the middle of the night, I do too, because I don't get to bed until late, but I never sleep for more than three or four hours of a stretch. Hmm. <laughs> then my eyes are open and I'm like, yeah, oh, no, not now. <laughs> no, sweet sleep. Uh, so we're at the top of the hour. We um, and we didn't get to a couple of questions, uh, no, we but we got at least to a few, three yes. or so. Yes. Uh, uh, I, I, I am still curious. This is, let's just leave it as speculative, how we might write poetry in all the dimensions that are, yeah, that's, uh, uh, <laughs> I wasn't noodling about that one because I, <laughs> that's going to take a lot more than uh, just a little bit. Of well, well, I want to work on this codex yeah. for uh, Cosmos. Uh, and uh, I think that various conversations could be leading there. And it would be um, nice to bring some multidimensional uh, perspective to really what is being encoded yeah, in that yeah. codex. Yeah, yeah. I mean, wh why couldn't, uh, you know, why couldn't a codex such as this, um, you know, have a similar function, maybe not on the scale or maybe, I don't know, uh, of a book like Genesis, mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, there's some narrative layer of meaning, but there are other aspects to it, which if you, know, you take the time to, to read it and to work with it and understand it would put you into that verition. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would kind of make you a cosmic cooperator or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe that would be a way to communicate with, uh, with the transcendent. <laughs> I, <don't know>. yeah. <laughs> I, I do believe that that whole codex idea, you know, which is originally a book, you know, found actually what got Christianity rolling. They could leaf through real quickly and find the spot without and unroll them. That was a real technical advance. <laughs> but you're trying to do it virtually. Mm -hmm. Same thing. And and that to me is a, a is, is simply a fascinating um, problem that, that, that you're trying to solve, you know, or issue or conundrum that you're trying to unravel, or Gordian knot that you want to you know, resolve. It is. You know, how, how do you do that in virtual space and not the other so good luck with that yeah well, <laughs> good luck to us all <laughs> yes <laughs> um well thank you both uh doug and ed for being well here. i'm glad somebody showed up so i didn't have to talk to myself right now yeah that wouldn't be too fun with it <laughs> no Night. No, no. Well, I've done it enough in my life where I talked to myself for hours on end and nothing came of it. You know? so. well, I, I appreciate your words. So thank you, Ed. And I'm, I'm, you. I'm a poor um, listener when it comes to myself. <laughs> well, that, that maybe is a topic for, yeah. for, a, for a cafe or for all of us to noodle. Or whatever. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Okay. Wish Take you the care. best, folks. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Okay. Work hard.